Our sermon text is taken from Psalm 19. Psalm 19, verses 12 to 14. These are the words of God. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we thank you for pouring out your Spirit upon us so that we might have these words of life and so that we might have life within us. We pray, Father, that you would send that same Spirit now to drive these words into our hearts. We pray that they would address our secret faults and our presumptuous sins so we might be kept free and delivered from every great transgression. We ask for this in the mighty name of Jesus, and amen. Amen. So the title of this message is How to Fight Sin. How to Fight Sin. But maybe the more complete title would be something like How to Fight Sin That Keeps Coming Back and Scaring You. Not sure if the Secretary would have let me put that in the bulletin or not. But there it is in the introduction. I'm thinking here about uh, the occasional angry outburst, uh, a significant lustful collapse, the occasional drunkenness or emotional meltdowns. So this, this message is applicable to everybody fighting sin, and that would be everybody in this room. So it it really is about how to fight sin in general, and the same principles apply, the same points apply. But what I'm particularly thinking about is um, where you think things are going along fine. You're just trundling along, doing great, walking with the Lord. It's blue skies and sunshine, and everything's going right, and all of a sudden you have a face plant, which seems like it's out of nowhere. So you think everything's going fine, you're doing morning devotions, you're, you're, just, you're doing your things, and then all of a sudden you have what feels like a face plant out of nowhere. Again, examples would be something like, you're not generally an angry person, you're not going around cursing and cussing all the time, but all of a sudden, so out of nowhere, something happens and you blow up. Out of nowhere, you lose it. You just lose it, you just lose your temper. Or again, you're, 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 you're walking in purity, you're generally, you're guarding your thoughts, you're guarding your eyes, you're guarding all of these things, and then suddenly, wham, you, hit, you have some kind of uh, lustful collapse. Or again, you're not, you're not given to drunkenness, you're not, you're not an alcoholic, you're not that kind of person, but from time to time, every now and again, all of a sudden you wake, you get up the next morning, you say, what in the world? How did that happen? I, I was clearly, I had too much to drink. Or maybe, again, it might be a, some kind of emotional meltdown. In general, you say, I've, I've got self-control. I generally, I, I, I guard my, my feelings. I tell my feelings where to go and what to do. And I'm in charge by the grace of the Holy Spirit. But then, out of nowhere, what seems like out of nowhere, there's a meltdown. And you, just, you say, I just lost, I just lose it. I just lose control completely. Where'd that come from? Where do those sins come from? And what can be done to actually defeat them? Put them to death, never see them again. Well, the psalmist asks a very relevant question in this text, in Psalm 19. Obviously, there's quite a bit more going on in Psalm 19, but here where it it finishes, where it closes, he asks a very relevant question. Who can understand his errors? Who can understand why we sin? Why do we do those things that in our sane moments we really don't want to do? Pastor Wilson over the years has called a sin temporary insanity. Temporary insanity. And, you, and, you, and, you, and it's a great app description because, um, you know, you, again, the next, next day or a little while later, you look and you're like, who is that person? Who is that person? It's like, you know, the full moon came out and you just started howling. You know, something, something happened and you look and you're just, who is that person? I, I'm not an angry person. I, I, that's crazy. That's, that's, it's, it's insane. I, I hate that. I, I'm, 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 not, um, I'm not given to, uh, to, to drunkenness. I'm not given to lust. I'm not given to emotional collapses. I'm not, that's, who is that person? That's crazy. Why do we do those things that in our sane moments we really don't want to do? 
We think it's, it makes absolutely no sense at all. That's not who I am. That's not who I want to be. And yet, from time to time, there it is, coming out of you. Something, there's something there. So what follows, what follows in these verses is David's answer to that question. Where does sin come from? Why do we sin like this? And his answer is that generally speaking, there are, there's a three-step process. Generally speaking, there's a three-step process that consists of secret faults, presumptuous sins, and great transgressions. So you see this in verses 12 and 13. He begins by asking God, cleanse me from my secret faults. Then verse 13, keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. And then I shall be upright and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. So you have secret faults, presumptuous sins, and great transgressions. The psalm then ends asking with David asking for particular deliverance from those first two. And you might say, well, why not the third? Well, the point is, is if you're kept back from the first two, then you're guarded from the third. So that's where David's prayer ends. His prayer ends with asking God to make the secret sins of his heart gone, cleansing him from the secret sins of his heart and the presumptuous sins of his mouth, looking to the Lord, his rock and redeemer, right? That's where he ends. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart the presumptuous sins that are likely to come out of my mouth and those secret faults that are likely to be in the meditation of my heart. Keep me from these things. Make them all acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Now, so great transgressions. What are we talking about? What are they? And where do they come from? People don't generally get up one morning when the sky is blue and the birds are singing and decide to ruin their lives. And people don't do that. Great transgressions do not come out of nowhere. Adultery, murder, grand theft, auto, embezzling millions of dollars from your employer, these all generally take some warming up to. They all generally take some warming up to. Some practice has to go into it first. And David says here that the warm-up is secret faults and presumptuous sins. Secret faults and presumptuous sins are the warm-up They're the practice for the great transgressions. So if if great transgressions are the overgrown garden, like the way overgrown garden, it takes some diligent ignoring of secret faults and presumptuous sins to get there. That's how you get an overgrown garden. In Romans 1, we have a similar progression described by Paul. In Romans 1, it says that God gives people over to uncleanness and vile affections because they were not thankful for God, their creator. They were not thankful, that's their secret fault, and they began worshiping parts of creation rather than the creator. There's your presumptuous sins. So that's Romans 1. In Romans 1, it says it begins, you, you remember that, that classic um, uh, trajectory, that classic downfall where you end up with um, men exchanging the glory of marrying a woman to marrying another man or a woman marrying another woman instead of being with a man. And, and, there, and that's, that's where it lands. There's your great transgressions. Just look a couple verses before that, and you have the same, again, these same broad categories, secret faults and presumptuous sins. The secret faults begin with not giving God thanks. Notice how it would be easy to miss that, right? You get it, you, you, you get it, you see it when we're talking about homosexuality you know, Obergefell decision, this kind of thing. But where did it start? Not being thankful. That's where it started, was not being thankful, not being grateful. That's where, They weren't thankful for the creator. They were, eh, whatever. Creation, who cares? It's not that big of a deal. Apathetic, not grateful, maybe eventually bitter. Don't like how this goes. I don't like what this creator God has done. I don't like the way he's shaped this world. Not grateful, but again, it's something that could be all inside, and somebody walking by wouldn't know. Wouldn't know, and you can put that you know, pretty polite smile on your face, but they wouldn't know that you're being a grouch. They wouldn't know that you've got a bad attitude. They wouldn't know that you're not thankful. That's the first step. And then it says, having gotten used to that, having gotten comfortable being ungrateful and having a bad attitude, they start worshiping parts of creation rather than the creator. 
There's your presumptuous sins, your outward sins. There, these are ones, now, in, in the ancient world, of course, you had full-on pagan shrines, you had statues and, 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 and altars and blood and smoke and the rest of it. Usually, modern, modern people are not quite so um, flamboyant, though we have our own ways of being flamboyant. Where, where, what is an idol? An idol is something that you're trying to, something that God made, something that's in this created world, that you're trying to get out of what only God himself can give. That's an idol. An idol is something that God made that you're trying to get out of it, something only God himself can give. It's where you're going for your peace. It's where you're going for your comfort. It's where you're going for your joy. It's where you're going for your glory. That's an idol. Okay, where, where, are, where are our idols? Where are all, all our shrines? Well, I mean, look where, where we put most of our money. Where do we put most of our money? We put them in stadiums. We put them at shopping malls. We put them in um, athletic clubs. Where, where are we going? We're going to all these places. Why? For our joy, for our peace, for our community, for a sense of belonging, for a good time, for glory. These are our idolatrous shrines. And of course, now we have all kinds of screens that connect us directly to those idolatrous shrines. Now, in all of these things, with all these created things, there's nothing wrong with sports. There's nothing wrong with cheering someone else playing sports. There's nothing wrong with being in good shape. There's nothing wrong with caring about health and fitness. Nothing wrong with shopping, right? The question is, is are you doing it out of gratitude to the one who gives it, out of gratitude for the one who gives all these good things, but you found your peace and your joy in him, and so now you get to enjoy the life that God's given you? Or are you trying to get out of this thing that God has made, the thing that only God can give? There's a, there's a vast difference. This is idolatry. And once you want, and, and the thing to note about these presumptuous sins is frequently they're socially acceptable. People don't, why, why would people walk in presumptuous sins? Well, because you can, you can become presumptuous in them. And they're the kind of things that you frequently can blend in with the people around you in them. But the overarching point is just to notice the exact same trajectory. You end up with a bad attitude. You start with a bad attitude in your heart. You start with ingratitude in your heart. Then it moves on to presumptuous sins that's frequently a form of idolatry. And you know, if you've read Psalm 19, what comes next. Great transgressions. That's what comes next. Similarly, it says in Proverbs 22, verse 14, the mouth of, a strain, the mouth of strange women is a deep pit. The mouth of strange women is a deep pit. He that is abhorred of the Lord shall fall therein. He that is abhorred of the Lord shall fall therein. So we put these things together. It's not the case that a man can be walking faithfully with God and then one day, out of the blue, fall into adultery. That's not where adultery comes from. It doesn't say that, you know, the mouth of strange women is a deep pit and who knows, anybody can fall in. That's not what it says. It says that he who is abhorred of the Lord will fall therein. God's already mad with that guy. God's already upset at that guy. Why? Why is he already upset at that guy? Because he's already been sinning. You don't just fall into that pit out of the blue, and nor is it merely the case that you shouldn't commit adultery merely because then you would likely fall under God's judgment. It's not merely the case that, yeah, you don't want to do the adultery thing because then you'll be in big trouble. No. According to this verse, adultery is the big trouble. God lets go of the guy who's already sending up a storm and says, all right, you want to do it your way? Good luck. And you fall in. You're already under God's judgment. You fall into great transgressions because you are already under God's judgment. From what? Secret faults and presumptuous sins. Adultery and homosexuality and all the other great transgressions are the judgments of God. They are the judgments of God, and it's where you end up when you've been letting the secret faults and the presumptuous sins go unchecked. So many Christians find themselves sometimes coming right up to what seems like the very precipice of great transgressions. Maybe you struggle again with angry outbursts from time to time, or drunkenness on occasion or lust, or lies, or an emotional meltdown. And by God's grace, you're caught, or the Holy Spirit convicts you, and you repent. 
But then you look at yourself in the mirror and you wonder, how did I get here? How did I get here again? And you really hate the sin. And, and again, you do well for a while again. You think, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going back there again. I'm not going to let that happen again. I'm not going to let that happen again. And then, what feels like out of the blue, you stumble and fall into it again. Where does that come from? Where does that come from? The Bible says it comes from being lax about your secret faults and your presumptuous sins. That's where it comes. And, and the challenge here is frequently, uh, you know, listed, you know, uh, angry outbursts. So then you say, yeah, that's, I don't know, yeah, where does that come from? And, and the temptation is, is that you've got, you think, all right, that's the thing I must not do. I must not get angry, must not get angry, must not get angry. And you're focused on the great, the, the, the last time where you, you did the face plant. And so all your focus is on that. Don't be angry, don't be angry, don't be angry. But notice that secret faults and presumptuous sins might be in a completely different category. They might be in a different category completely different category. Now, of course, you need to keep an eye on that. If you know, yeah, I've been like, I've, I've given into that before. Well, then keep an eye on it. Be vigilant about that. I'm not saying be lax about that. But what you not, need to start doing is looking around. So let's say it's just happened. Let's just say you've, you've, had, you've had a recent face plant. It's that thing that hap- comes, you know, every six months or every year or so. It happens. And it's really rare, but man, I want to stop that. Okay. So you just got rid of that big weed, this big gnarly weed. You just hauled it out and you threw it in the dumpster. Now, the temptation is to look for that big gnarly weed. But guess what? It doesn't start that way. Now, you might be thinking, okay, I'm looking for a big gnarly weed, but it's just a little bit smaller than that one. Okay, you're heading the right direction. But what you want to look at in your garden is anything that's not supposed to be there. You want to be looking for all the weeds. Look at all the, the, the little clover heads that are popping up, all the little spiky things that are poking up, even the ones that are tiny. And they may not be of the same species of the one that got you last time. Look, you, you need to be on guard for your secret faults and presumptuous sins. So what are those? What are those? Secret faults may be sins that you are sincerely, completely unaware of. That's a possibility. Secret faults may be sins that you are sincerely unaware of. In Psalm 139, David says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. So David here prays, basically, for God to search him and say, if there's anything in there at all that I'm not aware of that you can see, would you please deal with me? So there's number one. Make this a regular part of your prayer life. Don't assume that simply because you can't see it, it's not there. It starts small, and we're sinners. We're sinners, and it's, it's in our flesh, and we know until glory, until God raises us up and gives us new bodies, there, we've got it. It's in the air. It's in, our, it's in our flesh. So we ought to be the kind of people who say, Lord, if you can see it, would you either let me see it, or would you just deal with it directly? David prays for that. We ought to be the kind of people who pray for that. Lord, The stuff I can't see, please get at it. Please deal with it. Help me see it. Help someone else see it. Help me deal with it. That would be the first category of secret faults. We're sinful people, and even after conversion, it's still in our flesh, and we need to keep asking God to continue cleansing us, even from the stuff we can't see. We know that sin is death, and now that we're saved, now that we're given new hearts, we hate sin, we want to see it all die, and so we should be asking God, Deal with the stuff I can't even see. That's part of what secret faults includes. But secret faults are also, and I I suspect far more commonly, secret in the sense that they're in our heart and they're in our mind and they are virtually unnoticeable to anyone else. We know they're there. We know they're there. We feel them there. And we aren't addressing them. These may be wrathful thoughts or feelings or words under our breath. Right? It's down there. Nobody can see it. And maybe up on the surface, it's serene, completely serene. But, you know, you know, but if, there was a, if they zoomed in on the, the state of your heart, when that guy cut you off in traffic, what, what was it in there? What was it? In there? It was a tiny, tiny little bit of murder. But I was smiling the whole time. No, no. Nobody knew. It was way down there. Way down there. 
right? And you, and you say, well, I, I, didn't even, I didn't say any bad words. Okay, fine, no bad words were involved. What was that feeling? What was that sensation? If it was, if, did God see it? And what was it? He wanted to kill him. <laughs> right? that, that's what anger is. That's what it says. Jesus says that anger in your heart is murder. It's just a tiny, tiny, tiny little one. Yeah, what is it? It's, it's murder. That's anger, right? And, and, or the kids do something, and you don't lose it. But down here, down here, ugh. And, and, you know, whatever it is, but wrathful thoughts, feelings, words under a breath, or envy, envy, covetousness. You don't say anything. Smile on your face. Why does she always get that? Why do they always get that? Why can't I give gifts like that? Why can't my home be like that? Why, am I, why can't my kids be like that? Right? And it's, it's down there. It's, oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. I'm so happy for you. But down here, it's just, there's a little grasping fist, a little shaking fist. Why? Yeah, of course it would be you. <laughs> all the good things happen to you. You always get the best stuff. Right? You get all the lucky breaks. And it's, da- it's down there. It's secret. And, and it, maybe it's just a real passing it's a real passing sensation, real quick, and then bloop, it's gone again. You really are happy. It's fine. You see it. Yep, there it goes again. I know, but whatever. And it's little. And it's small. And nobody notices. You barely notice. You notice it. But you give it a pass because, you know, I mean, you didn't dwell on it. It just kind of hits you and it's spiked, yep, and it's gone. That's a secret fault. Or maybe it's lust. Maybe it's resentment. Maybe it's a little bit of bitterness. There was that one time where you had that run-in, and they never, you don't really think they ever really understood it. And so, you know, they walk into the room, and there's just like that momentary, like, blip, whoop, it's her, it's him, and it's gone again, and everything's fine, and you think, yeah, I know, it's just, you know, things, water under the bridge, you call it. But it's like water that just, like, keeps going under the bridge every time you go to that bridge, <laughs> yeah, right? You know, there it is again, right? And you think, yeah, yeah, just, oh, yep, yeah, there it is again, and it's gone, everything's fine or anxiety, or worry, or stress, or fear, or something like this. And there it is, that, that topic comes up, that subject comes up, and you say, I'm not, I'm, not a worry, I'm not a worrisome person, I'm not a fearful person, I'm not an anxious person, I don't stress out all the time. But when that thing comes up, or that person walks in, or that subject comes up, there it is again, ooh, a little wave, and then it's gone again, and you think, it was, you know, just, it's here and gone. It's here and gone, it's not, not a big deal, not, not a big deal. No. But the question is, is it sin? And the point isn't that it happens. Yes, sin. Yeah, okay. The, the, question, the key thing here is, is it getting dealt with? Is it going unconfessed? You see, you, if you say, well, it's little and it didn't affect me and I had a great time and I, you know, I didn't color all our conversation. Great, great. But did you sin? Did you? Were you angry? Were you covetous? Were you resentful? Were you bitter? Did it come? Did it hit you again? Just for a moment, okay? Secret faults. You know about it, but what you're doing is, what are you doing? You're saying, it's not a big deal. I don't have to deal with it because it came and went. It was very quickly. Very, very short sin. (laughs) Right, yes, it was a sin. And again, the point isn't that it happens primarily. The point is, you're not dealing with it. You're not confessing it. You're not repenting of it. Kill it. Lord, that was a sin. That momentary anger, that momentary wrath, that momentary remembering what she said that one time, and it just, you know, and I just, yeah, that's a sin. Did you confess it? Did you say, Lord, that was a sin? I sinned against, I'm, I'm sinning against you because of what happened. You see it, you know about it. Lord, forgive me, kill the sin. That's how you kill sin. That's how you deal with it. And you deal with it when it's small. Do you not want it to grow big? Do you want to see clearly and have a clean heart so that you can fight all the sin in your life? Then deal with it when it's the smallest. Deal with it when it's so little. If you don't deal with these secret faults, they almost always grow into presumptuous sins. Presumptuous sins are words or actions that are sinful that you have made peace with. They're words or actions that are out there. They could be photographed. If there was video surveillance, it could catch it. But you have decided that there's a good explanation for it. And so you don't need to confess it. You've decided that it's, it's socially acceptable. Everybody does it. And so you don't have to confess it. You don't have to 
deal with it. Usually you make peace with these sins because they're socially acceptable, everybody does it, or at least they're common enough for people to assume the best. You assume the best about yourself, well, I'm, but I'm, I'm hardly ever doing it anymore. I used to do it a lot more. <laughs> okay, that's not confession though. You just explained it. Great, hopefully it is less and less, but did you confess it? Did you put it to death? Did you put it under the blood where sin goes to die? Or did you just explain it? Did you explain it to a friend who saw you do it? Yeah, I used to do that a lot. and don't do it anymore very much. And are you going to kill it? Are you going to confess it? Are you going to say, and it's wrong, it's sinful, Jesus died for it, please forgive me. That's how you kill it. That's how you put it to death. And of course, some people see these and they know them about you. And, and frequently, they're trying to be polite. They're trying to be kind and gracious to you, so they, they figure, well, I guess, I guess he'll deal with that later. I, they, they see you bark at your kids. They see you snap at your wife. They see you snap at your husband. They see you complain. They hear you do these things, and they, well, I, I think she's probably going to take care of that later on, and they assume the best. But they saw it. They heard it. That's presumptuous sin. This might be complaining about your work, your boss. Well, you know, I mean, Everybody knows he's a jerk. Oh, okay. Right? Everybody knows, you know, you, 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 there's a little room for, you know, saying it, you know, how everybody feels out loud. Or the, the nature of the work. Or maybe it's homework. Or a teacher. Or a class. Well, everybody knows, he, you know, he's not a good teacher. Everybody knows she's the harshest teacher. She grades the worst. You just, you can't get A's in that class. You can't. Oh, this is NSA. S SCLs. I think those are A's. <laughs> the, um, but you, 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 you say, you say, this is, but that's just the way it is, and you explain why it's okay that you can say, well, it's, it's, it's really hard. Uh, I really don't like it. It's not, it's not good. And there you are, complain, complain, fuss, fuss, complain. And, well, everybody does it. Everybody does it. Or maybe you're complaining about politics. Well, you know, but I mean, have you seen what Joe Biden has done? I mean, I mean, did you see that? Yeah, right. But again, and there's a difference between saying, you know, this is what's happening, this is what's going on, that's unfortunate, this is bad, and complaining, fussing, or stoking up fleshly anger, wrath. Is it godly anger? Is it driving you to obedience? Is it driving you to love your people better? Is there more grace coming out? Well, if that's godly, I mean, that's godly anger. That's what godly anger does. Godly anger drives you to obey better. Or are you losing your temper more? And are you, are you a little, have you ever, you have a shorter fuse with everybody around you because of, the, because of inflation or because of, of public policy? Or are you complaining about your kids? Or are you complaining about your parents? Or maybe it's a biting or harsh criticism or correction of your family members. But they, they just know that's, that's my style. I bite off their head and they just know that. That's how it goes. That's how it works. My, my dad did it with me and look, I turned out. Right. Everybody's thinking, yo, oh, stop. They're used to it now. They're used to it now? Like, like that, that's good for them to get used to you sinning against them. Or do you say, that was wrong. I lost my temper. Please forgive me. I shouldn't have spoken to you that way. That was wrong. Please forgive me. Do you explain it or do you kill it? Do you explain it or do you confess it and repent of it? Or maybe it's foul language or cursing. Well, it's just under my breath and, every, you know, everybody does a little bit of that, right? Well, what, what, again, what is it? Is it anger? Is it foulness? Well, that's just how I grew up. That's, that's, that's how, that's how okay, yeah, right. We all grew up in sinful families. Welcome to planet Earth. We all have it. It goes way back. He said, like, yes, long family heritage. Great, yeah. Goes all the way back to Adam, actually. Sin, right? The, the, and the key issue is not that it happens. The key issue is, are you dealing with it? Are you explaining it? Are you explaining it away? Are you ignoring it? Are you just brushing it off the table, hoping it gets better, or are you Confessing it, or maybe lax entertainment standards. Music, with foul language, movies, shows. Are you letting it go? 
David's prayer is specifically that these presumptuous sins might not have dominion over him because that's what they're aiming to do. It starts with secret faults, little blips in your heart and in your attitude, thoughts that flip through your mind and you don't deal with them and they grow up into presumptuous sins and presumptuous sins begin to come out in our actions and in our words, but they're ones that we defend and explain away and again, we don't actually confess them, we don't actually repent of them and then they take dominion over us and then we fall into the great transgressions. When they begin to rule a person's life, that is, when these kinds of sins go unconfessed, you're walking in pride. You're walking in pride. That's what presumption is. Presumption, presumption says, I can do this and I can get away with it. Presumption, presumption says, yeah, I know this would usually be a sin, but, and then you have a good excuse. I was really, really tired. I was really, really hungry. It, whatever. This is, just, this, this is how my mom always talked to me. Okay? And then you do it, and the reason why it's so presumptuous is that you're sinning, and then you're having, you have the pride and the arrogance not to confess it, not to own it. You just explain it away, and then you look around and you think, the world didn't come undone. The sky didn't fall. Barked at my kids, but then they came in 15 minutes later like nothing happened. Guess it's fine. Told that little lie, nothing happened. Complained a bit, fussed a bit. Everyone's... Sky is still, everything's still good. But what are you doing? You're saying, I can do this sin and I haven't done anything so terrible that the Lord needed to die for me. I haven't done something so terrible that needs to be dealt with. It's just a little bit of poison, just a little bit of mold, just a little bit of gangrene. My leg didn't fall off yet. Something terrible hasn't happened yet. I must be okay. That's called pride because God's standing there looking at it. And you're pretending that in this world that God made, you can go on doing that and, and nothing will happen. That's pride. And that kind of pride goes before the fall. That's how great transgressions happen. So the Bible is extremely clear. The way to kill sin is by confessing it. This is where sin goes to die. It goes to die under the blood. That's where it dies. And it won't die with you just looking at it and saying, oh yeah, that was kind of bad. I'll try better next time. You didn't put it under the blood. You didn't, you didn't put it there. You didn't confess it. The way, you confe the way you put it under the blood is by confessing. It's in 1 John 1, 9, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's how you get clean. You confess it. You confess it to God, and you confess it to anyone you've sinned against. One of the most wonderful parts of that promise in 1 John 1, 9 is the word all. One of the most wonderful parts of that verse is the word all. We confess the sins we know about. We confess the sins we know about, and God promises to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It really is It's wonderful. Sometimes I use the illustration. You think about a little kid playing out in the mud. And there he is, he's playing in the mud. It's, it's been raining like it's been raining around here the last few days. And he, all of a sudden he looks down and he sees his hands covered in mud. And he's covered head to toe. But he can't see himself. All he sees are his hands. He looks up and sees his hands and goes running into the house. Dad, Dad, can you wash my hands? And, and the father looks down and says, absolutely, and puts him in a bath. Right? Right? Yeah, I'm going to wash your hands, and I'm going to wash all the rest of you too. When we confess the sins we know about, God forgives us from all unrighteousness. He makes us completely clean. And so, and so the, the thing that, notice the, the, the way that this works is when, you, when you're not confessing these little sins, you say, well, they're just little, it doesn't matter that much, not a big deal. They start growing up, and you get a cluttered heart. You get a cluttered heart, you get a dirty heart, and it starts getting dirty in there. And, and, and you think, and, 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 but the thing that you're not remembering is that there's, there's a sense in which, there's a way in which there's actually even more than you know about. There's even more going on than you know about. And so even when we confess the sins we know about, God's busy doing the whole cleaning job. And when you stop confessing the sins you know about, how much more is growing? How much more is developing under the surface? All that gunk is growing. Because there's more than you even know about. But in his grace, in his kindness, he says, when you confess the sins you know about, 
he will cleanse you from all unrighteousness, including all the secret faults we don't even know about. This confession, though, must be to God and to whomever else we've sinned against. This is how you kill sin. Incidentally, sometimes you, you do half the equation. You confess it to God, as you ought, but everybody, everybody in the room saw you lose your temper. And you walk out of the room, Lord, I'm sorry, please forgive me. And God says, yeah, I forgive you. And? And you, you got the sword about halfway in. What's the rest of it? Walk back in the room and tell everybody that was there, please forgive me. I lost my temper. That was sinful. Please forgive me. There's the rest of the thrust. Now the sin dies. Or maybe it's the opposite. Sometimes you might lose your temper in the middle of everyone and you say, oh, everybody, please forgive me. I'm, I'm so sorry. That was wrong. Please forgive me. And everybody says, they forgive you. And God's standing there. Do you confess it to the Lord? Did you confess it to God? That's how you actually kill it. That's how you finish the execution of your sin. Confess it to God. Confess it to those you've wronged. And that's how you put your sin to death. The message of these verses in Psalm 19 is that if you want to stop coming up to the edge of all those great transgressions, you want to stop coming up to the edge, kill the secret faults and presumptuous sins when they are little and rare. Kill them when they're little and rare. If you want a clean garden and a clean heart, confess your sins when they're tiny specks of green poking out of the ground, rather than waiting for them to be giant spiky poison weeds. Right? Pull them when they're small. Pull them when they're little. Pull them when you can get at them so easily and be done with them. It's really striking that David closes this, med this meditation at the end of Psalm 19 with a prayer that God would make his words and meditations pleasing in God's sight. But he asks for it particularly in the name of the Lord, his rock and redeemer. In my King James, it says my strength and my redeemer. But the word there for strength is the word for giant rock, giant rocky crag. And rock is clear enough. That image is clear enough. David asks for God to deal with his secret faults the meditations of his heart, and his presumptuous sins, those things that are coming out of him in his words in particular. And he asks for it in the name of God, his rock. And rock refers to God, his strength, his foundation, his fortress, his defense. God, my strength. God, my rock. Defend me from these sins. But do not miss that the word here for redeemer God, my rock and my redeemer. The same word here for redeemer is the same word that is used for the redeemer in the Old Testament who would avenge murder, who might also buy a relative's freedom who had been sold into slavery for all their debts, or who most famously, like Boaz, married and provided for Ruth, her kinsman redeemer. That's the word. O oh Lord, my rock and my kinsman redeemer. O oh Lord, my rock and my avenger. O oh Lord, my rock, and the one who buys me out of every form of slavery. Right? That's, that's the name that he pleads with God to remember. David's ultimate trust is in God who is both rock and redeemer, rock and near kinsman. And we, we who know Jesus have come to know this even more truly in him. The, the, the shadowy picture of the redeemer who, who avenges a wrongful death, a wrongful murder. The redeemer who buys a, a relative out of debt slavery. The redeemer like Boaz, who even marries this distant relative in order to raise up children for her and provide for her is a shadowy picture of our Jesus. A shadowy picture of our redeemer. And notice in all three of those ways that the redeemer acts, that Jesus has come. Are you dead? Have you been murdered by your sin, by your own sin? Jesus is the redeemer who comes to avenge our death. Have you, are you sold into slavery? Is, is, is your sin feel like that? I can't stop. Jesus, the redeemer, comes and has come to buy you out of every form of slavery. Are you lost, barren, feel like there's, I, can't, I can't make anything good come out of me, a widow? Jesus is the greater Boaz, and he comes and he makes his bride fruitful. And he's done, he's done this by his death and his resurrection. 
Someone told me after the first message that this was a real cheese grater of a sermon. And I think I understood, no, I did understand it. He said, he says, you know, you cut me in every way you could. And, 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 and this, is, this is what the word of God does. It comes and cuts. It comes and cuts. And, it, and, it, and what it's meant to do is drive you to your knees. Drive you to the cross, right? To the extent that you say, yeah, that's me. That's me. Guess what? Jesus is a friend of sinners. And, and the physician doesn't come for people who think they're well. If you think, I was doing fine, Pastor, until you showed up here this morning. I was doing pretty good. Then you were in a terrible place. You're in a scary place. Because Jesus is the friend of sinners. He's, he's a physician come for the sick. He's come for those who know they need deliverance. He's come for those who know they're dead in their sins. He's come for those who know they're enslaved to their sins. He's come to those who know that they're barren and they have nothing. Jesus comes for you. He, ca- he came for you. He died for you. He rose again for you in order to make you new. And so the charge is cling to him. Call out to him. And call out to him with the little sins. Don't, don't, don't be the kind of person that says, Jesus, I'll give you a call when it gets really difficult. What kind of near kinsman is that? No, call upon him with the little sins. Call upon him when it's little, right? Did he die for those? Did he pay the debt for those? Yes, he did. Don't, he's, standing, he's standing right there. He's right there and says, I've, I've, I've got the key. I can get you right out of jail. I, I'm, I've already paid it. That little lie, that little lust, that little envy, that little resentment, that little bitterness, that little wrath, it's right here. Do you want out? And when you say, yeah, I want out, please forgive me, right? There he is, the friend of sinners, not ashamed to stand with you. Our God and Father, we praise you and thank you for Jesus, who you sent for all our sins. Thank you that he died. Thank you that he rose again in order to make all things new. I pray, Father, that we would be greatly encouraged by this word. I pray, Father, that Jesus would be even nearer to us now. And I pray, Father, that we would see those secret faults and those presumptuous sins that we haven't been dealing with. And I pray, Father, that as we go from this place, we would have already confessed them to you and we would be already making plans to put it all right. Father, I pray that you would give us the grace to do that so that we might walk before you with clean hearts, full of joy, full of gladness, and complete freedom. We ask for this in the mighty name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Sing. It's another case of divine understatement, of hiding wisdom in folly and strength in weakness. We end each Lord's Day service with wine and bread. Doesn't look like much. We call it a supper, and we sing about feasting at the Lamb's high table, but it is really and truly a morsel of bread and a sip of wine. And yet this is a marker of far grander and more potent realities. We do not believe, as the Roman Catholics do, that though it looks like wine and bread, it's, it really is Christ's physical body and blood, and not that sort of thing. Rather, we hold that by this supper of normal bread and normal wine, the Lord communicates to us the assurance of his presence with us. We partake by faith. And Christ nourishes our souls. We obediently come. We obediently eat and drink. And by this simple and mundane act, the powers of earth and hell are defied. Philippians 1.27 describes the saints holding fast in one spirit, striving together for the one faith, and not at all terrified by the inevitable opposition. This is the assurance of our enemy's destruction, but of our salvation. So as you receive what looks to Caesar like a really paltry excuse for a snack, laugh in your heart with the knowledge that our God is in our midst and that we are indeed holding fast in one spirit, striving side by side for the one faith, and that Caesar has no idea that his kingdom has already fallen. In other words, come in faith and welcome to Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord God, this bread and wine are gifts which we gratefully receive from your hand. We rejoice that we have been made your children and may enjoy table fellowship with the Almighty God. Thank you for this sacrament. Thank you for confirming your word to us by this covenant meal. Thank you for nourishing our souls. 
Continue, we pray, your good work in us, that we may come to full maturity, that we may be conformed to the image of Christ. In his name we pray, and amen. I thought the Lord wove together what Josh had to say this morning with with my message. He was talking quite a bit about how God uses little things to do far more than we think or imagine. And I was urging you, charging you, to see the potency in confessing little sins. When you kill those sins when they're little, the Lord is, is actively at work. And you might think, I'm busy killing all these little sins. And the Lord says, isn't that wonderful? Right? I'm protecting you, and this is how your garden grows. This is how I make you fruitful in every way. I take these little things and I multiply them and I make them powerful and I renew all things. So go now with believing hearts, receiving the blessing of your God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of God the Holy Spirit be with you and remain in your heart always. And amen.